All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to the show. We got a lot of things to cover, to cover, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, first of all, um, I was trying not to cover this story with uh, the SBF and the FTX uh, lawsuit that's going through as far as the, the court case and Caroline Ellison being on the stand today. But there were some very relevant things that she said that I think everybody needs to know about what happened in the market back then and what could potentially happen in the future. So we're gonna get into that story in a bit, I promise you, but uh, just to kind of put things in context, I know that there's a, a lot of different uh, unrest, a lot of things happening in the Middle East, and of course, we've talked about this the last three days, and we can only, um, we can only deal with the things that we can control, not the events and circumstances that we cannot control. And I know people are down and they, and, and they, uh, you know, they, they listen to these stories and it's just, it's just horrible and it's awful. But just remember that not everything is as awful as uh, people make it out to be. There is some things that are going on that look uh, pretty positive. Uh, this is just from the Twitter spaces uh, from Mario. He says, uh, Qatar is trying to negotiate a prisoner swap between Hamas and Israel. So again, I don't know what's what's happening. I'm not a uh, geopolitical expert. I will not weigh in on this. I'm just telling you that uh, there are some positive things going on in a world that uh, seems to be rapidly de-evolving. Also, there was a story that came out uh, that uh, I, some people said will potentially be extremely negative for crypto and digital assets. I see this totally different. And this was a, this was a story from BL News. Israel police, Israeli police sees Hamas's crypto wallets on Binance. And of course, people will gravitate towards this story and they'll say, see, you know, crypto and digital assets, they're awful, they're horrible, and it's being used for illicit activities and terrorism and, and of course, uh, uh, all the, the uh, drug trade. And this is what's happening, why I think it's actually showing us the positive of crypto. Hamas sought to solicit crypto donations after its surprise attack on Israel. Israeli authorities seized the undisclosed amounts off of Binance. U.S. regulators in March alleged Binance illegally facilitated uh, Hamas's transactions. This is exactly what blockchain was meant to do. It was supposed to be an open and transparent and immutable ledger. And I think this is the exact same thing that we were hoping for. There was a report and it was put out by Michael Morrill. He is the uh, former FBI director, or excuse me, CIA director. And he said very clearly, the blockchain ledger <clears throat> on which Bitcoin and blockchain transactions are recorded is an underutilized forensic tool, <clears throat> excuse me, that can be used more widely by law enforcement and the intelligence community to identify and disrupt illicit activities. Put simply, blockchain is a highly effective crime fighting an intelligence gathering tool. Because of what this is, you will hear the negative parts about this, but just remind people that the reason why this was taken down so fast and it wasn't by cash transactions is because it was an open and immutable public ledger. So let's just get that straight. Also, I uh, just wanna talk about real quick on the macro side, it looks like PPI numbers came in <laughs> hot, which everybody's talking about. So of course, if we have that, that means that inflation will be sticky. September PPI month over month, looks like it was estimated to be 0.3. Previous was 0.7, it came in at 0.5. September PPI year over year, actual was 2.2, estimated 1.6, 1.67. So we know that this is gonna be a problem. And how does the market respond? Doesn't care. Seems like it's like, we don't really care what's happening. Here's the one day, here's the five day, here's the one month, eh, okay, not too bad. Six month and then off we go. But again, I think like it seems though that we know inflation is going to be sticky. The market seems to not slow down, except if it's our market. And of course, in crypto world, Bitcoin, and of course, alts really getting pummeled. Uh, we're down 1.7% and Bitcoin's down 22 So that's what's happening in, in the macro effects. And I know people are scared because they're thinking, well, now that this is happening, now they're going to raise rates. And of course, we've had various Fed Reserve former chairs come out and say, no, that's not what's going to happen. Also, the Atlanta Fed Reserve, uh, Bostic, um, he states that we don't need to raise rates. This, would act, this was actually yesterday. Now, this was before the report that came out. But if that's true, in the uh, November meeting, looks like we'll stay the same. We'll skip it. But it will still be higher for longer. So that's a little, little rundown of what's happening. Let's get to the big story, which everybody seems to love, FTX. And again, I wasn't trying to cover this because everybody's doing it and everybody's talking about it. It's being covered by everybody. But this part really makes me sit up and go, holy smokes, this was way worse than what I thought it was. So Caroline Ellison, Alameda took FTX customer money for whatever we needed. And we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about why this corresponds to the last bull run and just how bad SPF, SBF and his cronies screwed over everybody. So Ellison, Caroline, was the former CEO, the one in the uh, thumbnail I put in there. 
She's a former CEO of Alameda Research and Bankman Freed's on again, off again girlfriend, pleaded guilty to counts of fraud and conspiracy before this jury trial, which is going on right now. Alameda issued personal loans to Sam Wankman Freed, FTX co founder Gary Wang, and former director Nishad Singh, totaling $5 billion by mid 2022. They got $5 billion, took all your money. That's what it came, comes down to. Wankman Freed wanted to make an additional $3 billion venture investment from Alameda into various companies and asked her to run Caroline. Ellison to run an analysis of potential risks. Ellison's analysis showed that there was a 100% chance that Alameda would be unable to fulfill its liabilities. Let me say that again. She showed them that there's a not a 95% or 50-50, 100% chance they wouldn't be able to cover the liabilities if the loan terms were made the same and the market conditions worsened. And what did Sam Wankman said? Let's get it going. And they moved forward with a $3 billion investment. And that's just be careful who you think are like the gurus going forward. This is why I want to talk about this, because when Sam Bankman came out, he was on the cover of Fortune 30 under 30, and everybody loved this guy. And then, of course, he went and did a bunch of different interviews, and he said, you know what? I'm altruistic. I'm going to give everything to charity. I'm just here just to cover some funds and give all the money back. And that, of course, was a huge lie. Now we see that people in the bull market, in any market, it seems like, mostly the bull, is like when you get in this bull market, it can only go up. And that's what people will be like in the next bull run. In the bear market, it can, it'll only go lower. So in the next bull run, I'm, I'm trying to stick this in your head right now, but I think you guys are all pros by this time, is that when the next bull run comes, it's important to take profits and leave this alone because there's gonna be so many people swimming naked and we won't figure that out until the next bear market when the tide comes in. So to keep going with this, and this wasn't even the worst revelation, uh, Ellis admitted to defrauding both FTX customers and the lenders, as well as, deceiving, as well as deceiving lenders to Alameda. And then she says, he directed me to commit these crimes. I did those crimes. And Ellison said on the stand referring to Bankman Freight, which doesn't matter. If someone tells you to jump off a bridge, you do not jump off the bridge. If someone tells you to go rob a bank, you don't go rob the bank. You are going to be guilty. And I see some, some heavy charges. So that's just that first part. And this is from Tiffany Fong. If you don't know Tiffany, friend of the show, uh, you can follow her on Twitter. And she's also got a good YouTube channel. And she just put out some pretty big information. But this was another bombshell. Caroline Ellison just t t testified that Thai prostitutes were involved in an attempt to regain access to a billion dollars of Alameda funds frozen by the Chinese government. <laughs> you can't make that up. And that's under oath. So this is something that she told the jurors, everybody in the courtroom. And this, of course, is unless she's guilty of perjury, saying that, yes, this is what we did to try to get the funds back from China. And uh, we use Thai prostitutes. On top of that, this is from Watcher Guru. Just in, ex girlfriend Kelly Ness and Sam Bakeman Fried conspired to keep Bitcoin price under 20K by selling customers Bitcoin. And this is what always stuck with me because the last bull run, and we all know it, it just seemed off. There was just a lot of things that just didn't really add up. We should have gone a little bit higher. We should have gone a lot higher, I think, on some of these things. And it just didn't. At some point, it just stopped. And I think this information is going to come out with this trial that there was heavy, heavy manipulation going on. And I hate to say it, but when Gary Gensler is looking at these spot Bitcoin ETFs, he's going to say to themselves, okay, for all these different decentralized exchanges, can they manipulate? And before anybody lambasts me and say, but Rob, there's huge amounts of fraud in equities and precious metals and everything else. Well, yeah, that's right. But the thing is the SEC has their dirty hands covered around it. They don't have it around here for crypto. So as they're coming into this Bitcoin ETF in the spot, these types of cases are gonna really ring true. And I think it's gonna be a bigger problem, especially with the SEC taking a look and saying, hey, give us more information about this spot ETF so they can, I think, and eventually turn it down. I'm not saying that it'll always be uh, disapproved, but I do think it's not looking too good, but I could be wrong, I've been wrong many times. Which leads me to the last point. So we just took a look at that, those bombshells and that nonsense, but here's the big thing. It doesn't matter the events, it's just how we, our actions and response to these said events. What are you gonna do? This is happening, this has happened before, it'll happen again. You have to look at your portfolio and see what can I possibly do. This is from uh, Thomas, Tomas, hey apoyo. He's doctorate in Bitcoin, bronomics. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I linked him in the description. He put out a nice little chart like this. And it's, it just pretty much says, what do you want to do here? Because everything kind of lines up. 
2011, 2013, you know, we had a bear market, heavy accumulation, then a bull run in 2013. Happened again in 2014. And I, I like to see how this actually goes. 2014, 2017, you had a bear market, you had accumulation. And then, of course, leading into the bull market of 2017, you had the Bitcoin halving in 2016. We said the same thing in 2018 and 2021. And uh, bear market. And see this accumulation phase? Look how far it went up. That's amazing. But you see right here, right before we hit in this, this bull market, this big, huge dip, that was a global pan. That was a Cerveza virus, as George Gammon would say. And uh, it's dropped out precipitously in March of 2020. And then, of course, we got the Bitcoin having and everything took off to the moon. And now we have this and we're in an accumulation phase. I personally believe we're headed for a recession. Everybody says it, so it probably won't happen, but I think it's going to happen, maybe in Q1. And when that happens, we could probably have a big drop as well, but that's what accumulation is for. Do you wanna buy Bitcoin at $70,000? Do you wanna buy Ethereum at close to five grand? Or would you like to do what I did, which was a while ago, buying Ethereum at $96, $84, buying Bitcoin at $5,000, $4,000, buying Cardano at three cents and five cents. I'm not saying that's what it's gonna be, but I'm saying that's where I made all my funds. I can't give you financial advice. I'm just some guy talking to a computer in front of a really nice green screen. So take it as you were, I'm not your dad, do what you want. So that's it for that little piece. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then here's some good news, but kinda, and you'll see what I mean in a second. JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, friend of the show, just kidding. Uh, the blockchain-based collateral settlement application goes live. This is on their, their blockchain called Onyx. I'll tell you what this is, but don't get too excited. So JP Morgan's TCN, or Tokenized Collateral Network, went live by completing its first transaction involving the clients BlackRock and Barclays. BlackRock used the Tokenized Collateral Network to convert shares in one of its money market treasury funds into digital tokens then transferred to Barclays as a collateral for an over-the-counter derivatives trade between the two institutions. And they're using this thing called Onyx Digital Assets at JP Morgan. Before you get excited, like, hey, they're using blockchain. They are, but Onyx is a private blockchain that is based on Ethereum that has nothing to do with an open, usable ledger. It's a private, and it's only for JP Morgan. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, we can do this, but of course, who wants to trust JP Morgan all the way? I think this will be good for certain transactions and all transactions. So it's good to prove that blockchain works. It's a bummer that it's on the private network. TCN is initially focused on money market funds. It will look to add support for other collateral like uh, stocks and uh, fixed income. And this is the whole crux of it. Of why you do this? Well, asset tokenization, which is what Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock said is the, is the future. It leads to quicker transaction. It's like skipping the step of converting your paper money into coins when you want to use a vending machine. I know some people who are younger have no idea what this is. Back in the day, you used to actually have like a dollar machine and you put a dollar in, you get four quarters and you can actually use that to use that for the, uh, for the vending machine that you use, right? We didn't have debit cards and stuff all like, like that. So this just says you can use tokens directly and get your snack faster. And that's what they're doing with, with treasuries and um, uh, maybe equities as time goes on or money market funds. So, uh, that's what we have there. I think that's, that's positive in blockchain, but again, not a big thing, but this I think is pretty good. Uh, Amazon and Immutable, Immutable X want to make it easier to launch crypto games. It looks like Amazon and Immutable X have partnered up. What are they doing? Immutable has joined AWS's Acceler program, a sales program for companies that use AWS services and their products. Game developers using the Ethereum compatible Immutable X can now join AWS Activate a program for a startup that offers tech support and up to $100,000 in AWS credits and other resources. I gotta ask the question though, is that, is that for the ethos of decentralization to put everything on Amazon Web Service? I'm not here to debate that, but I uh, just found it kind of interesting. But I mean, it's good in that regard that they're, they have that inroad with Amazon. And Immutable X, if, um, it could be one of the big plays coming in in the next bull run. I had interviews with a couple of different of the people that know a heck of a lot more than me in the Web3 space. Uh, Johnny Hustle from uh, Crypto Banter had Stash on a couple of times and Kagi. And I asked them this question, like, what's your place? And Stash and Kagi, Mutable X, and also Johnny, 
immutable X, they say that's one of their plays and one of the things that they're actually looking into. And I think it's one of those tokens that uh, has really gone up in value as time has gone on. But who knows? If you want to take a look at these videos and a ton more like it, there's a link in the description. And it will take you to Dan Teaches Crypto. It's a 100% free website, very easy to use. I don't even spam you. And we got all the best stuff here, and you can find all it as much and easy as you possibly can. So there's that piece. And then also, uh, I don't know if you're into Dogecoin. I like Doge. I think it's uh, not a bad product. And by the way, it's been the top 33 since 2014. I think it's in the top 20 still. So I know people think like it's like a meme coin, but I think it's been around more than a lot of coins that have been out there. But I just found this. This is on Twitter where you can find everything. Is that Dogecoin, as far as for in the code of the Cybertruck on Tesla, it says Dogecoin payment method bridge. Now, this could be a joke from Elon Musk, but if it's not, that's a pretty big play. And I've said before, let's see if this is still actually relevant. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Funny enough, uh, Elon Musk on his Twitter profile, and this is the right one, 159 million followers, uh, he's got two logos. He's got X, formerly called Twitter, and the Dogecoin logo. So I don't know if Dogecoin is something to be uh, looking at, but if that was true about the Cybertruck and Tesla, pretty big. And then also <clears throat> Canada. Uh, oh, Canada, what's, what's happening? So it looks like there's a little bit of censorship and some things going on. And looks like Bitstamp is going to exit Canada in January. So if you are a Canadian viewer, you have until January 8th to take all your funds out of Bitstamp. But that's not just Bitstamp. It's a lot of things going on. Bitstamp is the latest exchange to exit the Canadian market. Following Binance and Bybit, OKX, Paxos, and DY, DYDX also left early in the year. Unfortunately, new guidance related to stable coins and investor limits provided to crypto exchanges make the Canadian market no longer tenable for Binance. That was said back in May. The exits earlier this year came as the Canadian Securities Administration's administrators, excuse me, gave crypto asset exchanges a deadline of late March to register with them and meet pre-registration requirements. I'm not going to go off on a tangent and say this is like the worst thing of all time. I don't know what the registration requirements are. I don't know how bad it actually is, but it looks like it's bad enough for these exchanges to leave. Now, did they leave because they don't want to deal with the paperwork or maybe they were doing something behind the scenes? remains to be seen. I have no idea. I'm not a lawyer, especially not in uh, securities, but it is just telling just how many uh, exchanges have left Canada so far. So I don't know how many exchanges are left in Canada. If you could put that in the comment section, that would be fantastic. But it's not just censorship, if you want to call it that, for exchanges. It also looks like there's some other things going on as far as like broadcasting and social media. This was from the government of Canada. The CRTC or the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission just took a step forward to modernize Canada's broadcasting framework. This was on September 29th, 2023. So here's what's happening. Today, the CRTC is advancing its regulatory plan to modernize Canada's broadcasting framework and ensure online streaming services make meaningful contributions to Canadian and Indigenous content. I guess it looks like another tax. CRTC is setting out which uh, online streaming services need to provide information about their activities in Canada. Online streaming services that operate in Canada offer broadcasting contests and earn 10 million, so you got to be up in that range, or more in annual revenues, will need to complete a registration form by November. CRTC is setting conditions for online streaming services. Streaming services to provide, with the, to provide the CRTC with information related to their content and subscribership. That's you! So if you're listening to people, especially with podcasts <clears throat> and subscribing to them, and they have over $10 million in revenue, they, that goes to the Canadian government. I'm not saying that's like the worst thing of all time. I'm sure you got a driver's license. I'm sure you probably got to register for all that fantastic uh, health care that you guys get. Some people say it's awesome. Some people say it sucks. I don't live in Canada. I have no idea. So I'm just saying that, you know, there's just one more thing the government's going to leverage against you. The decision also requires those services to make content available in a way that is not tied to a specific mobile or internet service. And then a third consultation is ongoing. It considers contributions traditional broadcasters and online streaming services will need to make to support Canadian and indigenous content. Again, looks like a little bit of a tax. So I don't know about you, 
but maybe this is a time to take a look at to a VPN. Uh, I have one, I use one all the time. It seems to hide a lot of things and protect me. And just so you know, this is from Nord and it comes out about what Google knows about you. We all know this. I know a lot of us don't use VPNs. I didn't use one for, for a quite time, but I'll get personal information. It, it shares what you like, your hobbies and interests, of course, your location, your relationships, what you're watching on YouTube. You watch digital asset news and God knows what else. Browsing history, all the things that you have, which, you know, who wants to see that? And then, of course, the emails that you have. So I use NordVPN. They did not pay me for this. This is just me talking about NordVPN. I have an affiliate link, but you don't have to use it. You can go right to NordVPN and sign up. But if you do, you're going to miss out on a discount of 25 to 45%. So anyhow, NordVPN, the reason why I like it, because it's the fast, I've used some other ones. I haven't used any of these, but it's the fastest VPN that uh, we have out there, 67, 30 plus megabytes per second. And I've used some other ones that slowed everything way, way, way down, which kind of sucked. And then of course, the four big things that I like, uh, as far as like streaming and easy VPN setup, did you know that there's only seven VPNs? Well, not seven, but one of the VPNs that can unblock Netflix in 2023 is Nord. And why is that cool is because I was just talking about, there was a series that went about Uber and how cool it was. Like I watched, it was a very good series and, and was, there was parallels between Uber and what's going on with crypto. I thought it was great. And all my Canadian uh, people that watched, they said, we don't see it on Netflix. What's great about NordVPN, instead of you know protecting yourself and, and not having and being hackers and all that stuff, is that you can set it to somewhere else in the, in the world and say, yeah, 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 I'm not in Canada, I'm in Albania or UK or I don't know, Italy, wherever else. And you just download it, you put it in your phone or you put it on your desktop and then you say where you're at. And of course you can watch a lot of other things besides the stuff that you, that's available in your country. Also on top, it might actually help you with actually getting news if you're in Canada. There's a strict no log policy, meaning they don't collect or store your private information and you can put it up to six devices. Here's the cool stuff. So. There's two options. Well, it's three really. Two year plan, it's like three bucks a month, plus is four bucks and complete is five bucks. The one year plan, and this is this is yearly. So it's like five bucks a month. That's 60 bucks that you gotta pay up front or plus or complete. And the difference is cloud storage and stuff. I don't use that stuff, but you can try it. You can do these things and you can go with that one. And there's a 30 day money back uh, guarantee. So give it a shot, try it out. If you don't like it, you're like, yeah, this doesn't work for me. And that's it. There's a link in the description, looks just like that. And uh, that's it, again, this is an affiliate link, not a paid promotion. Don't have to use it, you can go to NordVPN, and that's it for today. So look, ah, we did pretty good today, actually. Not too long. That's it for today. So if you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Thanks for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Good times ahead.